You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, with service members from across the military, sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week. Lots to get to before we get started with this week's episode. I want you to do us a favor. Next time you're on our website, hazardground.com, click on the Sponsors tab at the top of the homepage and check out some of the great affiliate sponsors we have for this podcast. Click on any of the sponsor banners, and when you make a purchase from any of these companies through our website, you're helping out the podcast tremendously. With the holidays coming up, no better place to do your shopping than through our sponsors. It helps us out. It keeps all the episodes that we have ad-free, and certainly it helps veterans all across the country. If you got a reader in the family, or you know some people who want some great books as gifts, you can also purchase any of the books that our guests have written directly from our website. Again, hazardground.com. Click on the list tab at the top of the homepage. It will take you to our book and film list. There you'll find books from former Hazard Ground guests, as well as films that some of our guests were involved with or based on or even played a role in, and also films that outright inspired us and this podcast. With the holidays coming up, don't forget about our promotion with Amazon. You know how it works on that same website, hazardground.com. Click on the Amazon banner, do all your normal Amazon shopping, and that will help us donate back to veterans and some of the great charities you've heard featured here on the Hazard Ground podcast. Also, don't forget to send in guest suggestions. Always love to hear from you guys. If there's someone in particular that you'd like us to try and get on the podcast, let us know. Send us an email at producer at hazardground.com. We've had a few listener suggestions on in just the past month or so. Last week's episode with Dave Sabin, who was a listener suggestion that came all the way from Australia. Jeff Dardia, Brigadier General Retired Don Bolduc, just to name a few. So keep those listener suggestions coming. We love hearing from you guys. Don't forget to follow us on all the social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Keep up on the show. You can also reach out to us that way. Now with all that out of the way, I am so excited for this week's episode. Joining us this week is a retired Marine corporal who in his lone deployment to Afghanistan was wounded. More on that in a moment. He is currently on a tour for his book, You Are Worth It, And I saved this for last. He is the youngest recipient of the Medal of Honor in history. It is our pleasure and honor to welcome Kyle Carpenter to the Hazard Ground Podcast. Kyle, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Hey, thank you for this opportunity, brother. I really appreciate it. Uh, Absolutely. Listen, and again, thank you for your time. I know it's precious, but for those who aren't familiar with Kyle's story, uh, I'll let him tell you why he got the Medal of Honor. And it's just, it's, it's so fascinating to speak with you guys because. The stories vary so much, uh, and, and the life after of a Medal of Honor winner, it's almost like being Miss America. Not that any guy knows what Miss America is like, but it's sort of that sort of fame and notoriety and everywhere you go, so we'll talk about all that. But Kyle, we always like to start back at the beginning. How and why did you get into the Marine Corps? Yeah, so I joined the Marine Corps, and I went to boot camp in the spring of 2009, and... Uh, I think there's two levels to this. The first is I joined the military because I wanted to commit my life, uh, my path and purpose, and now, you know, my body to something bigger and greater than myself or any one individual. Uh, And so that was, you know, my reason for joining the military. Uh, But I joined the Marine Corps specifically because growing up and up until that point in my life, I had always uh, welcomed and thrived on challenge, whether that was sitting as a little kid in the recliner with my dad trying to master blowing bubbles with gum uh, or on the high school football field. I wanted, you know, I knew my limits physically, mentally and emotionally at that time. And so I joined the Marine Corps specifically because, uh, yes, you know, I I knew uh, and had researched and talked to people about the professionalism, uh, the incredible legacy and history of the Marine Corps, you know, but just on a personal why I joined level, uh, it I wanted something that would push me to those limits that I already knew about myself. but would also push me further and make me really, uh, I guess you could say dig down deep, but 
really look at myself and into myself and look deep down and find new limits of what I could do and how hard I could push myself and how great I could become. The idea of combat never bothered you? I mean, it's 2009, 2010, I think you said. We're, we're in the middle of two wars. Obviously, you knew you were going. That didn't deter you at all? Did your parents say anything about it? Uh, well, yeah, that was, uh, and, and I talk about this in, in the book, but it was very hard on my parents, especially my mother. And, you know, I wasn't ignorant at the time. You know, I knew that we were, uh, as a country, as a Marine Corps, in combat in two countries and on two different fronts. But, you know, and this is just me, uh, even looking back now, nine years after getting injured, combat and my journey and what I went through along with my fellow Marines, even today is still too surreal and kind of crazy to just fully comprehend and grasp. Uh, so I say that to say back then, yes, I think I was educated, maybe not as much as I could have been about what I was getting into, but yes, I knew that there was a chance for me to be put in harm's way. I did know we were in combat, but you know, my drive and determination and what I felt just to myself personally and, and internally, the reasons I joined because of, you know, wanting to be a part of history and that bigger purpose and that greater kind of life mission, no matter the risks or what I could comprehend were the risks at that time, no matter what they were, even if I was told when I signed on that dotted line, you're guaranteed, you know, we can look in the future and we know that you're going to be in harm's way every single day on the ground in Afghanistan. My reasons for joining would have overshadowed and overpowered any risks or fears that I had. That's incredible. I mean, just to contrast this, you know, I signed up pre 9-11 and, and I wonder, this is a hypothetical question that may be tough to answer. But had 9-11 not happened, do you think you would have felt the same? Because, you're, I mean, you're younger than I am, so you grew up with war, right? It's been around since you were, what, 9, 10 years old, somewhere in that range, right? So yeah. with that in mind, you know, it's when you grow up and we're constantly at war, it almost becomes the norm for you. Like, it's an option. Whereas for me, you know, when I signed up pre-9-11 and I was talking to my parents about going through ROTC and everything else... There was the whole, well, you're not going to have to go anywhere. Like, you know, we're not going to war. Like, everybody just thought naturally, I'd do my four years and get out and move on yeah, to something get, else. Get as some a, skills right, for life after. As, as a way to yeah. pay for college and move on. So, for you, this was an option, though. Yeah, and, and uh, yeah, you're right. I've actually never really thought about it like that. Um, but that is a, <laughs> kind of a crazy life scenario do you want to go to war or not pretty much um but now that i'm thinking about it uh i yeah i absolutely still would have joined um you know but thinking of what my job could have been or you know what uh, i would have been driven to do might have been altered or changed slightly but sure. i I uh, I feel like I absolutely still would have joined and still would have had that drive and and kind of purpose seeking mentality that I had. All right. So now you said you did a little bit of research. Were you mentally prepared for boot camp when you got there? <laughs> uh, even more so than combat, I think boot camp is just something that you know your your thoughts and your preparation and your mentality can only be prepared and, and kind of uh, be put into context so much before you step on those yellow footprints. Uh, so, uh, and, and actually, you know, I didn't, I researched more of the Marine Corps and just what it was about, what it could offer me. I actually didn't dive in uh, to too much boot camp research because my thought process was, 
you know, just like everyone, I knew it was going to be hard. I knew it was going to push me. Of course, none of us until we get there know how much. But when it came to boot camp and really any challenges that I could foresee or, you know, guess would be coming my way, I think I knew at the time that I, I couldn't really comprehend or get prepared. And I also had the, the mindset that no matter what came my way, no matter how much I was run down, you know, I was trying to think ahead even before boot camp about those moments that were going to push me to my limits and how I would handle those and how I wanted to handle those. And ultimately, I just had the mindset that, one, nothing was going to stop me from becoming a Marine. But two, in those kind of individual moments uh, and getting pushed to my limit, I just thought, you know, I know it's going to be hard. I don't know what's coming my way. But when it does, not only am I not going to quit no matter what, but also in those moments, you know, what am I going to learn about myself? How am I going to self-reflect? What am I going to take away from those? So I tried to uh, get mentally prepared, but not in a specific kind of way, just more in a, I guess, looking long term and, and uh, you know, how I was going to become the Marine that I was, I was going to be and how I wanted you know, to, to be a Marine that, that, uh, you know, was coming mm -hmm. after those generations that so heroically and, and courageously paved the way. Compare for me, put them side by side, your level of preparedness and ability to handle those moments in boot camp. you know, that you knew were going to be tough and how you're going to overcome them. Or as you were a Marine already in combat, did you feel like those moments are easier because of the training you had in boot camp? Uh, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, you know, I think by the time we got to Afghanistan, you know, whether it was completely the training that we went through kind of all day, every day, um, but also, you know, just the reading and kind of training I did on my own outside of those working hours, uh, you know, I'll never say that it felt normal or I could like comprehend getting shot at all day, every day and thinking every single night. OK, you know, really thinking to myself when I lay down at night, hey, is this the last time I'm going to lay my head down on my pillow and go to sleep on my own terms on this earth? Uh, so that, you know, I don't think that will ever be completely normal. But when those times came. Uh, I felt more confident and, you know, I, I knew what to do as a Marine and as a person that was just in that uniform to the right and left of those that also raised their right hand. But boot camp, uh, you know, boot camp was, was everything, not only learning how to handle a weapon, how to hike with a hundred pounds on your back, but also how to be a Marine, how to, measure those ribbons on your uniform, how to uh, perfectly make and measure, you know, your bed to be perfect in line with everyone else's. So uh, there was so many more unknowns in boot camp. Uh, but, you know, just Afghanistan was different uh, to have, you know, really have and feel and know that every single day your life is on the line. You know, it's interesting. Let's pause here with this because, we, met, we talk about this a lot in the, pod, the podcast, the dealing with your own mortality. And that does different things to different people. And, and in reality, for the civilians listening to the podcast, you know, I can't explain to you what that's like. I mean, for civilians, like if you've ever been robbed or whatever, you say, oh, my life flashed before my eyes. Well, I don't think that ever happens with us when it comes to combat because there's two things at play, right? I mean, there's... What is my life? What have I done? What have I accomplished? You know, if this is my last day on earth, what does that mean? But there's also the, the other task of, I still have a job to do. And part of my job is to make sure that I'm saving the lives of the guys next to me and I'm fighting alongside of the men and women next to me and doing my job so they can do their job so we all can come home alive. Like, those right. are conflicting ideals because one is internal and the other is external. So, yeah, absolutely. You know, the, the, how you deal with your own mortality is critical to the survival of combat. 
Yeah, that's a great point. And, uh, yeah, you're right. But, you know, my take on that is, uh, you know, I, I don't think the kind of internal thought process of self-preservation, you know, will ever completely go away. Obviously, you care about yourself. You don't want that day to be your last day on earth. But like I talk about my book, and which I didn't, I don't think, fully grasp at the time, but everything is is a lens. And everything in life is the lens you choose, how you want to look at it, and the perspective you choose, or at least try and attempt to bring. And so, yes, uh, Self-preservation um, will always be deep down in there somewhere. But at the same time, you know, from the moment, uh, at least just, you know, this is just me and, and my journey speaking. But is the from the moment we step on those yellow footprints at Marine Corps Boot Camp, whether Paris Island or San Diego, it is ingrained into us every single day. Uh, that, you know, just like what I was searching for when I joined, that there is always a bigger purpose and a greater mission than yourself or any one individual. Yeah. That the Marines to the right and left of you, that their lives are more important are, than yours. Are, yeah, are equally, if not more important than yours. And also, and I think most importantly, and the way they teach those lessons is, you know, when we're training and when we're cold, wet, hungry, and miserable, you know, and every night before we go to bed, they sit us down and, you know, it's pretty much the only time in those 13 and a half weeks of boot camp that you're not getting screamed at. But they sit you down and they tell you stories of those Marines that not only raise their right hand, but that that, you know, that stepped into the unknown and a life of service. And that so many of them gave that last full measure of devotion, you know, to 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 be worn down and to be at boot camp and just every fiber of your being is trying and longing to earn that Eagle Globe and anchor and that title Marine. You know, when you're run down like that and you get told of stories of the Marines that at 17, 18, 19 years old were told, hey, we're about to charge this beachhead. You're probably not even going to survive to make it out of the landing craft and put your boots in the sand on the beach. You know, but as teenagers, as, as you, men in their young 20s they they charge forward anyway knowing the inevitable cause the marines that after 13 months of fighting in vietnam you know covered grenades for their fellow marines and and navy corpsmen those navy corpsmen that you know with without even knowing that there were any casualties laying out in that field and knowing the amount of enemy suppressive and deadly fire coming their way, they charged forward to save those Marines, even not knowing if they were still breathing or not. And so, you know, to hear that every day, all day, uh, I don't think any amount of training can guarantee, you know, that, that the person you trained is going to step up and, and be heroic. But just on a deeper level, training aside, to hear those stories every day, it makes us want to be courageous and it makes us want to step up in those times of need for our, our friends and our fellow Marines in uniform mm -hmm. or out. And so, uh, you know, I, I'm still trying to work through and think about and learn like how far can training really take you and then when you know do, does more of you take over 
Uh, but with that said, uh, and, and I know we're going to get to it, but on the roof that day, I'm just, with everything I just said, I'm just so thankful and proud that I stepped up how and when I needed to. And, you know, what I talk about in the book is, uh, and, and I just want to make this kind of special point before we move on and I, and I have <laughs> grenade brain and I forget to bring it up again, <laughs> but, uh, you know, I in the book and, and I got asked a question a couple of years ago while doing a question and answer session. And it was asked to me by a very influential global motivational speaker. And, uh, he said, you know, when I, when I think about it, the list of people that I would cover a grenade for is very small. It's very short, just a couple of people. And I truly don't know if I could step up and be that person I needed to, if a grenade was thrown, you know, in, in our vicinity. And, uh, I had a great answer and I'm, I'm surprised cause it was, I was very much put on the spot and I'm so <laughs> thankful that I had this, <laughs> that I had this answer. Uh, because I realized when he brought that up and all these people through the years on the road during my speaking engagements, uh, you know, telling me, well, you know, I was never in combat or I was never in the military or I never did anything like you. I want people to know, and, and this is important, that, yes, I just went through, all, you know, the training and the mindset and mentality that the Marine Corps instills in us. You know, but, but in the civilian world and in the military world, you hear about all the time, you know, people, you know, freezing up or, 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 or not reacting. But at the same time, the beautiful thing about the human spirit is you never know how and when you're going to step up and either be that friend, that person, that Marine that you need to in that moment. So if you would have asked me before that grenade got thrown at us, you know, would you jump on a grenade right now? I don't, I couldn't. And I don't just being honest, I don't think anyone possibly could. I mean, that's such a crazy and surreal thought. I mean, okay, I jump on this grenade and, you know, I, I'm literally signing my ticket, you know, the end of this life. And so, uh, you know, just like struggle and just like, you know, looking at these opportunities of, oh, if could I step up? I wonder if I could, you know, just like struggle, these things are things that we should never compare with other people. Um, you know, whether it's stepping up in that time of need or healing from, from something that knocks you down in life, you know, our struggles, our victories, you know, are unique to us. And we either need to be victorious or heal or get better or make progress in our own time. And, and, and those things, uh, I think it's a very slippery slope and, and, and could be a potentially kind of dark road to go down if you start comparing these things that everyone handles differently in life. Sure. And I know that was a little tangent. Yeah, no, sorry, I mean, but it, I, I, I had to get that out. It, it's perfectly said. Um, and I think you, your perspective on advantage point is one that we can all learn from because people, it's natural to say, well, I wouldn't jump on a grenade and normal people wouldn't. Like that's not something that people are conditioned to do. As we just talked about, like self-interest, you know, self-survival um, are, are things that are biologically innate in us uh, and that we are trained from birth to take care of our own self. So to do anything counter to that, and, and the fact that you're speaking in, in these terms, I think is very relatable to people. Um, okay, so let's kind of uh, get chronologically back to the story. You graduate boot camp, what month and year? Graduated boot camp uh, July of 2009. Okay. After that was followed by two, roughly two and a half months of school of infantry. infantry. Mm -hmm. And after that, uh, just a few weeks after getting drop to, uh, I guess you could say the real Marine Corps and my unit that I was going to be living and operating with the next four years, uh, 2nd Battalion, 9th Marines, uh, just a few weeks after graduating SOI and becoming an, an operating fleet Marine. I went on my first deployment 
which was a three month float on a Navy ship down through the Caribbean. We uh, stopped at Guantanamo Bay, did a couple of uh, months of in- intense training down there. Uh, and we also stopped by Dominican Republic, helped train some of their forces on helicopter operations. And on the way back, just a couple days before Christmas, which we were trying to make it back for so everyone could go and leave and be with their family, myself and my fellow Marines were all huddled uh, around this half working, half static connection TV down in the depths of this Navy ship, the USS Wasp. And uh, we were watching President Obama and anxiously awaiting whether he was going to give uh, essentially the thumbs up or the thumbs down on a 30,000 uh, allied troop surge into Afghanistan and ramping up operations there. As we were watching it, uh, he approved and gave that thumbs up. And we knew that with that, we were going to be the one of the first uh, units and kind of boots on the ground in line into Afghanistan to, uh, to be inserted into there. And so I guess that deployment unknowingly to us until that moment was the start of our seven, eight month workup before we left for Afghanistan in July of 2010. All right. Got two questions real quick. One, that deployment to the Caribbean, how much trouble did you get in? Because <laughs> uh, I don't believe for one second you went through those three months in the Caribbean at Guantanamo and Dominican Republic without getting in trouble. <laughs> hey, if I told you I'd have to kill you. But okay. I'm, I, I'm, That's I'm, fair. Uh, let's let's just all the cards say, on the table here, Kyle. <laughs> I'm not going to say that we didn't sneak a, uh, a few Cuban cigars on, but other than that, I okay. was still a... Uh, very right. much a scared, a scared little junior uh, boot marine. So I thankfully, I didn't do too too much crazy I, stuff. I, I'm sure you had some some uh, you know corporals and sergeants who might have led you down a path that was not less than stellar. But we we, we can all just draw our own conclusions <laughs> about what went on. Okay, that's fair enough. You made the point. I got it. Okay, second question. <laughs> You're watching this uh, press conference with President Obama, and I'm envisioning you all huddled around this little TV, as you said, and he makes the announcement yet that, you know, they approved the troop surge. And I'm envisioning 30 Marines standing up screaming, hell yeah, and you all pumping high five and everything. Or was it more like a little subdued than that? I think it was uh, uh, a, a, a perfectly balanced mix. You know, there was some high five some hey let's go this is what we've trained for mm-hmm. uh i know myself and i did see a few others that did it really show emotion and that were more reserved because the moment it you know still wasn't completely real we had seven eight months to go to really train and work towards this thing but in that moment uh it getting more you know, real than it was before this announcement started, I immediately went into deep thought mode and thinking, okay, uh, what does this mean? You know, really, what does this mean? When exactly are we going to go? What do I need to do to, to mentally, physically, and emotionally as much as I can get prepared? And I think the big question that, uh, you know, we never know until those moments happen, you know, what is going to happen right. and what does yeah. my future hold now that now that we're going to do this. So um, it, it, it was a nice mix. But I will say I know that we were all ready to start training and to become as efficient and, and operational together as a unit and as a family as possible. What did you say to your mom and your parents when you told them you were going to Afghanistan? Uh, I mean, you know, I think they, they knew from the very beginning, um, that it was eventually going to happen. Yeah, I think so. And, and maybe not specifically Afghanistan, but they knew that at some point in my four year slash military career, Marine Corps career, that I was going to be put in harm's way. Um, but again, you know, my drives and my motivations kind of overshadowed, overshadowed any of those negative or kind of daunting dark thoughts along the way okay when do you actually get to afghanistan month year what are you told what's your mission give me the background 
So, uh, you know, no matter who you're with, what branch, uh, the mission, uh, at least from my experience, is determined on when you're there uh, and kind of where in line you fall in getting to that area of operation. So with that said, we were one of those first units in to Marja, Afghanistan. And because we were one of the first ones in, you know, just like kind of anywhere in the world, uh, even in your yard at home, you know, you can't build a nice, big, beautiful garage if you haven't cleared off the land. So when you go to these combat zones, you can't start building schools and roadways and and creating fresh, clean drinking water dams for people until you have a stable foundation, until you have pushed out or eliminated that enemy that is creating all of these problems and that is oppressing these people to where they're terrified to, to maybe start a school for the local children in the villages uh, or, or might be, you know, scared uh, to, um, you know, just talk to American troops that are there trying to help. And so uh, because we were there so early, our mission, as crazy as it sounds, essentially was to every single day, you know, I was living and operating in this small village and, and more specifically in a small mud compound uh, in, in Marja. And so uh, it was just myself and my platoon, roughly 60 Marines, and we broke, broke down into four squads, uh, four squads, which had average about three fire teams of four Marines in it. And every single day with those four squads, we would send out an early morning patrol, a late morning slash early afternoon, a late afternoon and a night patrol. And people listening might ask, what exactly is a patrol? You just, you know, load yourself down with the gear you need and ammo. And at least for the time period, kind of in this moment in 2010 when we were there, our mission on patrol was to leave friendly lines and to walk around and patrol and do that until the enemy shot at us. And so every single day, uh, in the simplest way to put it, our mission was to pick a fight with the enemy. Sounds Therefore, like a real hoot, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Oh, real good time. Great vacation. But uh, no, every day, you know, picking that fight with the enemy allowed them to come to us, uh, allowed us to either continue to push them further and further out therefore creating more of that stable environment uh, or, you know, eliminating them if uh, they chose to continue to fight. And I think it's important for people to know, and I talk about this in the book, but, you know, there are uh, a lot of terrible, evil, um, no regard for human life Taliban in Afghanistan. Yeah, uh, I think, and hopefully a lot less than there has been in the past, you know, some of the people we were fighting, you know, were forced to pick up that weapon and shoot at us. You know, they were people that believed in a in a brighter, more hopeful future for their country. But because the Taliban not only took, you know, half of their agricultural profits that they made every year, therefore financially debilitating them and their family, but also, I mean – you know, for anyone listening, put yourselves in these people's shoes. I mean, you have no way out. You're being watched by these evil people all day, every day. And you have a weapon put in your hand, just like the kid that had a grenade put in his hand and was forced to throw it at us, who loved Marines during that deployment. You know, these people put a weapon in your hand and they say, hey, you know, you're going to help us fight and shoot at these Americans. And if you don't, we're going to behead your whole family. And so, you know, with getting back to the mission and, and picking a fight with the enemy, uh, 
it was not only picking a fight with the enemy, but also, uh, you know, pushing, uh, almost giving people an option, kind of pushing those people out that, that, you know, didn't want to take up arms against us. Therefore, the ones that did stay and fight, you know, we knew uh, were the Taliban and were the true enemy. So, uh, you know, if we were there a couple of years later, which some of my buddies were. They kept deploying back to the same area. You know, a couple of years later, uh, there were schools, there were paved roads and and clean water wells. But you have to go through those you know, r- rough first couple months or years creating that stable environment and getting rid of those people that disrupt that, that type of environment. So that's when we were there. And, uh, in 2010 and 11, you know, the enemy's vital kind of bloodline and cash flow is those illegal crops that those, uh, poppy plants, which create opium, opium, which creates, you know, pure black tar heroin, which leads to, uh, I believe in 2011, the, the UN did a, a, a survey and 82%, uh, somewhere around there, you know, you get heroin off the street anywhere in the world. And it came from that little agricultural piece of land, our area of operation right there in Marj, Afghanistan. Wow. So along with pushing that enemy out, disrupting those kind of cash flow lines, And uh, all of that, you know, illegal trade, uh, doing all of those things, we were hoping to, you know, that would eventually lead to uh, a better life for the people of Afghanistan down the road. Kyle, you mentioned that you had lost some Marines along the way. What did that do to you? What do you remember about those guys? And, I mean, what stays with you from the guys that you lost? I mean, even today, just uh – eating Louisiana hot sauce, which was one of my buddies who was killed, Dakota Hughes. A couple days later, I was injured at patrol base Dakota, named after him. Um, you know, but just, just you know, speaking about him, uh, him coming in, us arguing about our favorite hot sauce. He is from uh, Greenwood, Louisiana, and him – you know, talking about how I was going to come visit and everything after the deployment. And he stepped on an IED and took his last breath and gave his last full measure of devotion at 19 years old. And so, you know, we lost numerous Marines, Navy corpsmen, and uh, you know, above all of that, amazing patriotic Americans. And again, choosing your lens and the perspective you try to bring, is it incredibly hard to lose those Marines and and not just Marines, those people, those humans and those men that you care about? Yes. It's, I don't think it will ever not be gut wrenching, but with that said, uh, it, and and I don't want people to take this the wrong way because it is kind of tough to say and hear, and I don't want to sound insensitive, but you know, it's and it's such a beautiful thing. But we raise our right hand. You know, all those that that gave that ultimate sacrifice and that last full measure of devotion. As hard as it is, just like I told my parents when when they were begging me, my mom was crying all day every day to to not join uh, and, and put myself in harm's way. You know, I had to sit them down and tell them, "Look, this is my decision. This is what I want for my life. I might not fully be able to comprehend the risks, but I know the risks, and this is what I want." And this is what I I feel called to do and I need to do for myself. And, you know, it is a volunteer force. And and as amazing as that is, you know, what comes along with that is knowing that all of these troops that have so heroically given 
you know, that ultimate sacrifice, they did it on their own terms and they did it without anyone making them. And they went and they raised their right hand on their own and said, you know, I will give up to my life for my country and my fellow Marines. And so I try to focus on that and I try to just be thankful, you know, like General Patton said, that such men and, and, and women live. And uh, it's just, uh, it, you know, it is very heavy and very hard, but at the same time, uh, I'm thankful and so honored that, and humbled that I was able to serve with them and alongside them. And, and, you know, also, I think I feel a little more comfortable speaking on this because I did think those moments as I was bleeding out on that roof, you know, I thought that was it for me. And knowing that those could have been my last moments, looking back as tough and crazy as it is for me to say, I wouldn't change anything. And, you know, because of the blood loss and, and I think just in the, in what we think are our final moments, you can't really do any, anything else, uh, to help the situation you're in. And I, and the blood loss obviously makes you very weak. And I think makes it peaceful for you to exit this earth. But with that said, as me, everything that was going on in my head, I was upset and kind of crying, I guess, to myself in a way, just in my head with the emotions and thoughts that I had, you know, I wasn't thinking, oh, I wish I had more time left in this life to travel or like do badass stuff or, or whatever it is. My final moments when I realized and tried to, and I finally put those disoriented pieces together, when I felt myself bleeding out and I knew that I just inevitably and unfortunately only had a few seconds left, I thought about my family, specifically my mom and how devastated that she and they were going to be that I did not survive and make it home. I said a quick prayer for forgiveness and anything I had done wrong. And that was it. You know, so with that said, uh, I, it wasn't thoughts of regret or I, man, I wish I wouldn't have joined or I wish I wasn't bleeding out right now. Or I wish I wasn't, you know, my life wasn't ending right here at 21 years old. It was just my family, people I loved and how I had lived up until that moment. So I say all of that to say we join for a purpose. We're honored and proud to serve. And as tough as it is to have those empty holes and those, you know, you know, gut wrenching pieces of information that tell you that, hey, you know, Dakota or fill in the blank Marine or Navy Corpsman, you know, didn't survive. As hard as that is. We should celebrate and how uh, how beautiful and and profound, you know, a life it was that that person with no one making them ended their life short and gave that ultimate sacrifice for their fellow Marines, but also for something bigger, more courageous uh, and more amazing than themselves or any one individual. Beautifully said. Okay, so I do want to go through the actual events because we've t- kind of tap danced around what happened. Um, you know, it's the morning of November 21st, your alive day. You know, what happened to you, as, as we've discussed. You know, about a month ago, prior to that, you had celebrated your 21st birthday. So uh, you're, you're in fairly good spirits. But that all said, take me through the morning, take me through the events of leading up to what happened. November 21st, 2010. The first thing that I remember from the entire day and one of only two things that I remember is our base started getting attacked and we started getting shot at just like every single day for the previous four months that we had been in Afghanistan. Around 745 that morning, I remember hearing those AK-47s outside the walls. I remember slowly rolling over, uh, you know, because at this point, it wasn't we were desensitized. It was just, 
you kind of get to where you know and, and you can feel how immediate a threat is. Right. And so I knew our base wasn't getting over overrun. I just heard the AK-47, so I slowly rolled over. And I remember unzipping my sleeping bag as I thought to myself, you know, here we go again, another day in Afghanistan. And that is it. That's really the, the last thing that I remember from the entire day, except for fast forward hours later until later that afternoon, still the 21st. And myself and a fellow Marine are on what's called a post position, which is essentially we're on top of a roof, an elevated position, and we're standing guard. And we're looking out for enemy, enemy activity that could potentially hurt us or the Marines that are inside the compound, not on vigilant watch. And so it's just myself and best friend, Lance Corporal Nick Frazio, on top of this roof. And Marines, you know, no matter where you are in the world, safe, deadly environment, there's always Marines on watch on those post positions to protect their fellow Marines. We stand post for four hours at a time. And we were towards uh, the very end of that four hour shift. <clears throat> Everything I'm about to go through was concluded and our pieces that were put together through a very thorough and extensive two-year and over 250-page investigation done by the Marine Corps and Department of Defense. And this is because uh, you, you recall none of this due to your injury, right? Correct. Even that lapse the of last, time from when you got up to when you got to the rooftop, you forget that just because of the injury? I believe so. Okay. Uh, you know, and, and I think a little bit of fog of war, but at the same time, you know, uh, for years I had actually done interviews and I had told all these people and I had thought we walked and patrolled down to this compound and took it over the day before, but really it had been down there two days. I think I just got rocked so hard. It kind of messed my time frame up. Uh, but anyway, uh, we we're towards the end of our four hour shift and the enemy initiated a daylight attack. This attack was different from the ones that we had seen for those previous four months we were there. And the attack was initiated with hand grenades. Three hand grenades were thrown into the compound. And hand grenades, for those of you that thankfully have never heard them, are extremely loud. I mean, my buddies heard the one that hit me almost a mile away. And so I don't remember those first three grenades that were thrown. The fourth grenade was thrown and landed on the roof in very close proximity to myself and my fellow Marine. And we were only surrounded by a small wall of sandbags. And uh, again, I don't remember seeing the grenade, thinking about it, but from that extensive investigation and they even brought a post blast analysis team to do forensics on my gear and what they call the seat of the blast, which is essentially where it blew up in the hole. Uh, from all of that, it was concluded that I moved forward and attempted to shield that grenade blast and the blast from my fellow Marine that was on top of the roof with me. And you know, from my sleeping bag to the only other thing I remember, which is physically how I felt after the grenade detonated. I was very uh, confused, to say the least. I was just so disoriented. And I was just, I was not only reeling from just feeling like I got hit really hard in the face, but things continued to get more real uh, in my mind and uh, my vision was as if I was looking at a TV with no connection it was just white and gray static my ears were ringing extremely loud just as they are still this very moment and so I was working through those disoriented pieces and I was thinking okay and all this is going on in my head and I was thinking okay man I got hit really hard by something the last thing I can remember, 
I was in Afghanistan, but I also remember being on a roof. What could have injured me this bad on a roof? Maybe I got off of the roof, went on a foot patrol, stepped on an IED, and this is just the last thing my brain can kind of remember and register. And this next part will allude to the love Marines have for each other and our weird sense of humor. I think I know uh, where you're going with this, there, but go ahead. Yeah, I was sitting there trying to put these pieces together, and that's interrupted by what I thought was warm water. I'm thinking, really, guys, as banged up, in a state as I'm in right now, maybe clinging on to life, who knows? I don't know what's going on. But really, you're pouring warm water all over me? <laughs> and I thought about that for a couple seconds, and then that final piece kind of allowed all the other ones to fall into place, and it gave me uh, the unfortunate realization that what I was feeling was not warm water, that it was blood, and I was profusely bleeding out. So kind of like I was saying earlier, this is that moment where I knew that from how I was feeling, the casualties I had unfortunately seen so far on that deployment, and just the basic medical training we get as Marines, I knew that with those pieces of information and how I felt that my time was short uh, and not only was it short, but that short time was going to be my final moments on this earth so i thought about my family specifically my mom now devastated and, and sad she was going to be i said a quick prayer for forgiveness and anything i had done wrong in my life and a tiredness and exhaustion that still nine years later it's impossible to recount or describe completely and very quickly started to consume me and I, at that moment, was, I guess you could say, at peace. And I let, I stopped fighting and I let that exhaustion consume me. And I closed my eyes and I faded from consciousness in the world on that hot, dusty rooftop. And uh, I woke up roughly five weeks later with snow outside of my hospital room window pane. I was on the other side of the world in Washington, D.C., and my first sight was slowly opening the only eye I had left and seeing red Christmas stockings hanging on my hospital room wall that my mom had decorated you know, while I had been battling that darkness and death. And really, uh, that moment in waking up, yes, I had three years and roughly 40 surgeries to recover, but waking up that really started my journey and, and uh, my, my purpose and path, uh, ironically, that I was searching for just when I joined the military. But um, it just became so much more extensive and, and deeper when I woke up to this you know, bonus round that I'm living now. Who was the first person you saw and what do you remember hearing or saying? Uh, my dad, and I mentioned this in the book, uh, now, now I saw my dad and I, I said, Hey dad, but that was the first moment when I really woke up as Kyle, I had woken up briefly and I forget it was either right before or right after a brain surgery when I was in ICU. And because of the injuries, the being disoriented and waking up after three or four weeks and the medication I went through, I mean, it seemed like months, but I went through a few hours of intense, I mean, intense is an understatement, but intense hallucinations. And so for those few hours, it was extremely hard, not only on me going through it, because everything seemed so real. And I mean, it was just like super out of this world hallucinations, like crazy stuff. Um, Do you remember any of them? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, everything from massive spiders attacking my hospital room to me thinking that my parents had spent all their money. They couldn't even feed my brothers anymore. They sold their house all to pay for my medical care. You know, which as a junior Marine, 
you get these pre-deployment briefs, but uh, they kind of tell you, hey, this is what's going to happen and how it's going to go. If your loved one comes back perfectly fine with their unit, or this is how it's going to go if your loved one comes back in a box. But there's really no in between. And, you know, besides Navy corpsmen, probably just because I was only in a year and a half and I was a junior Marine, and you don't really think about those big picture things of, hey, what happens if I don't get killed and I get limbs blown off or, you know, my eye blown out or like I'm damaged from head to toe? What happens? And so, with that said, I didn't really know about, you know, military medicine in the sense that some of my best surgeons and the greatest surgeons in the world wore camouflage every day and, and you know, wore camouflage to the hospital in the morning when they were about to do my 13-hour limb-saving surgery. So, with that said, I didn't know that the financial means were there to help me. So, in that crazy, hallucinated kind of disoriented state thinking that my parents were at their at their financial and kind of emotional end of their means i saw my dad loaded down with shotguns and ammo charge the emergency room and demand i get this life-saving surgery and i'm sitting there laying in the hospital bed and i really was like crying and trying to scream out i had a trach at the time Machines were helping me breathe, so I couldn't even really make any noise. But I was begging my dad and telling him, please don't do this. I don't care if I can't get this surgery or they can't save me. Like, don't do this. And he charged in the emergency room and demand I get the surgery and SWAT completely wasted. And <laughs> Taliban attacked my hospital room. And wow. I watched my own funeral and no one came. And so these crazy just – I crashed a – a crash a plane into Turner Field where I had grown up going to Braves games my whole life. There you go. So I was just so out of my mind. So with that said, thankfully they brought me out of that kind of by putting me back under. Um, but when I really woke up and could comprehend that, hey, I'm here, I'm alive, the, those hallucinations really didn't happen. The first kind of normal thought and words that I had was, hey, Dad. Let me ask you. Does it bother you or is it frustrating that you have memory of these hallucinations, but no memory of what actually happened? Uh, yeah. I, well, so yes, absolutely. But not anymore. Why? Um, at, uh, uh, uh wait, are you talking about the moments on the roof? Or yeah. Like when like, I was in the hospital? No, the moments yeah. on the roof, like, you, like, you can't remember how it all went down and, and ultimately how you ended up in this spot. You had to have it told to you, as you mentioned, secondhand, but through a 250-page investigation and two years long of people testifying and this, that, and the other. But you have these hallucinations with such clarity. Uh, I know. Um, uh, yeah, it used to frustrate me that I couldn't remember. And I don't think it would to the extent it did if the entire military and kind of world was looking into me who i am what actions i took or didn't take and i was never hung up on it and never was like looking at news articles every day and seeing what people were saying it was just it, i think just because now whether you want to look at those few seconds on the roof or five weeks that everything was completely black and dark and there was nothing there, and I was in a way non-existent. No matter how you look at it, it did frustrate me that I couldn't remember. And again, that was probably just uh, amplified by the fact that everyone was looking into a story and my life that I couldn't remember. But after some time, you know, healing, self-reflection, and kind of deep thought, I realized how wrong that kind of approach and mentality and thought process was and immediately I just kind of did a 180 and I, I started framing my my thoughts as hey who cares if you can't remember it's just a thousand miracles and like amazing 
that you're still here, that you're alive and that you woke up to not, you know, remember those moments. And Hey, you got hit in the face (laughs) with a hand grenade. (laughs) Like it's okay. Understandable that you can't remember these things. So, uh, in that moment, I've never kind of looked back anymore and got frustrated since. And I just, like most of my journey, I haven't had control over a lot of it, and it's been a lot of unexpected twists and turns. So right. I just let the investigation, which I didn't even know was going on really, and people's opinions and all that, I just kind of let that, uh, you know, I stayed in tune with it, but I just kind of let it go by the side, and I didn't really let it hang up my thoughts anymore. When is the first time you have contact with Nick Euphrasio, the Marine on the Roof, whose life you saved? Uh, actually it was amazing, um, that just a a few weeks after we were injured, after I woke up and I'm sure, you know, he did too. Uh, we were just a few rooms down the hall from each other at Walter Reed. Oh, wow. And, and, uh, was that comforting? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was comforting. It was tough though, because we couldn't, neither one of us were mobile or could make it to each other. So what we did was, and he started it, but he wrote, what's up, Kyle, on a little whiteboard. And we passed that. I couldn't write, but uh, I think someone in my room helped me out. I can't really remember. But, yeah, we sent that that whiteboard back and forth to each other since uh, we couldn't really get out of the bed. But, uh, you know, I appreciate you bringing Nick up because I think it's important you know, whether it's talking about veterans or, or anyone that went through a tragic injury in life. Uh, you know, I have scars from head to toe, but Nick is an example of, and, and an example for so many that, you know, just like with any struggle in life, so much struggle is invisible on the outside. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and Nick again, sustained some serious injuries as well, too, right? I mean, he wasn't free and clear of this thing. Oh, no, no. Yeah, absolutely. And, and what I'm getting to is he had a, a – he experienced a, a very traumatic brain injury. And so uh, the brain is obviously a, a beautiful uh, but very delicate thing. And so, uh, you know, I, I talk about uh, him as respectfully uh, as I can, but really any time that – it does get brought up because I think it's important to educate people and tell people that, hey, there's not only traumatic brain injuries, um, you know, but you never know what struggle people are going through. And just because you can't see it doesn't mean it's there. And everyone, no matter if you think their struggle is big or less, again, you shouldn't compare struggle, but everyone, you know, should be shown love and compassion because a lot of the toughest things we go through in life, you know, you can't see from the outside. And so thankfully, you know, Nick uh, is doing, you know, much better, just like I am. And I'm thankful that, you know, above everything else and things that we're going through, that we both lived, survived and woke up to live and learn what this new life and body means for both of us. But Again, you know, most importantly, we're, we're both still here. Just for the audience who's not familiar with your story, if you can, real quick, run down the list of injuries that you had and where you are with everything right now. Uh, yeah, so um, I had penetrating shrapnel to into my brain, which some pieces are still there. They removed the ones that they could. Uh, I lost my right eye. Both my eardrums were ruptured. The right was completely blown. I had a hole which had to be repaired by a patch in my carotid artery. Most of the damage and most of my recovery and 40 surgeries was because of the facial and oral damage that I received. My jaw, uh, you could say, or it could be argued that it was pretty much blown off of my face uh the grenade blew most of my teeth out which again was a lot of the length of my recovery to build upon every surgery which finally led me 
or allowed me to eventually one day get implants to allow not only my face to have better and more normal kind of form, uh, but also for me to eat properly. Uh, I had a fully collapsed right lung, which makes sense because from the forensics, that's where the grenade kind of in the right upper quadrant um, to the side of my heart was. Both my arms had extreme uh, nerve and tissue damage. My right arm alone had 30 fractures. And I had, uh, it was by far the most minor and really isn't even worth mentioning, but I had shrapnel and uh, just kind of um, non-life-threatening tissue wounds on both legs. When you look at a picture of yourself pre-blast and you look at a, yourself in the mirror now, what do you see and what's the difference between the two guys? Well, uh, no, you can't. You can't not see the scars, but I, uh, let me rephrase it a different way, Kyle. Let's try this. If you got a chance to talk to that Marine pre-blast, what would you say to him now? I would say that there's nothing you can't make it through. And, you know, when I look in the mirror, of course I see the scars, but that's not really what I look at when I look in the mirror and I truly reflect and look into my own eye and look at my own self. Uh, I see and I feel someone that has not only been through a lot, but that got knocked down in the hardest and worst way possible. But I also see a Marine, a survivor, and someone that, yes, got knocked down, yes, has scars, yes, is physically, mentally, and emotionally different, and that's okay. But I, I see someone that has got back up after they've been knocked down, and Thankfully, I had that realization because that is a part of my purpose and my journey now to tell other people that before they even have that moment that they have to really look at themselves in the mirror. And I think those moments are vital and important in life and to to people to really, especially in this day of age and technology, to sit in quiet or sit in that front of that mirror and to make it a moment that it's only you, yourself, your thoughts, and what's in your head. Uh, but with that said, I'm thankful that I, I have realized that and I've gained that perspective over the years. And that's what this book about is about, not combat or the military. It's about getting through struggle, but most importantly, telling people that, again, after getting knocked down, by life no matter what it is yes you might be physically mentally and emotionally different you might have those scars that some people unfortunately see as ugly but you can truly come back better and stronger than you were before whatever knocked you down and not just come back better and stronger but you can do it with a smile on your face and it's just you just have to know that that some things as you know, they're going to be hard. They're going to take time and you don't have to know your plan or where you're going or what the next surgery or day or therapy session holds. You just have to know that you just have to take that small step, just work hard, try to be a good person and stay positive. And I promise you can get through it. And one of my favorite lines in the book, and I think it summarizes from this point that I'm talking about perfectly is the smallest of steps eventually completes the grandest of journeys. 
And, uh, you know, my journey before the grenade blast was amazing. I'm thankful for it. But really who I am, what I've done, and the things I'm most proud of happened from the blast on. And, you know, I, I attempted that marathon, and now I've completed three marathons and jumped out of planes and graduated school because I want to show people that, hey, it might take, you know, again, you know, it might take a week for you to heal, a year. You might be working on healing the rest of your life, and that's okay. You know, but at those crossroads, those struggles and, and those times where you get knocked down in life, you know, you always have a choice. You always have a choice to take that next step. Or, And it's a tough pill to swallow, but realize that you're either going to take those small steps and move forward, or you're going to sit right there in that moment, whether it's feeling sorry for yourself, or you know, whether it's not taking care of the loved ones around you, or whatever it is. You're going to sit right there in that moment for the rest of your life until you choose to, as painful or hard as it is, as small as they are, take those small steps. And, uh, and yeah, I just I hope that just with this podcast, which I appreciate you giving me the time and the platform for and just this book, you know, I, uh, I just I just want to tell people you can get through it and and you're stronger and more courageous than you know and that you think is possible but again back to the very beginning of conversation that's the beautiful thing about people and the human spirit you never know how great you are how great you're going to step up or how much of a hero you're going to be big or small you know to those around you when you think back on all the surgeries and the recovery and everything else what was the hardest part of that Knowing, seeing, and feeling, and experiencing my parents having, and my family, my brothers too, but my parents suffering through that burden of a recovery with me. You know, I raised my right hand, I deployed, I got injured, and now they are arguably in the tougher place of being on the other side of that hospital bed and watching their oldest son struggle for every breath and try not to tear up because the pain meds wore off after that 13 hour arm surgery and they can't get on top of my pain or knowing that my brothers were opening their Christmas gifts and celebrating Christmas in a hospital room and that my mom and my parents, who have never missed anything in, in any of all three of our lives, from T-ball to walking across the stage at college graduation, you know, my mom, who would never miss anything, missed my brother's birthday. And they were in middle school, an you know, important part of their lives, missed their birthday because she was sitting by my hospital bed, you know, praying for me and, and just hoping that I would cling on to life. Uh, and so... Uh, you know, that, and that's just a, a point to military families and those who love and support us and are truly the backbone of what makes service members so great, so effective and so courageous. Uh, you know, they were truly suffering through that recovery with me and me knowing that it, it, you know, the silver line to it is it kept me strong. It kept me positive. It kept me going because I knew they were feeding off me, but it was very, very difficult on me, uh, for me to know that they were going through that. Yeah. I mean, I, I can understand that. It's, it's not the same, but it, it's similar in a sense. You know, you, you could say a lot of things about me you could say a lot of things about, you know, my, my service or whatever, but what I get defensive about is when you call into question my service as it pertains to how many nights my mother laid awake while I was gone on the other side of the world wondering if she was going to get a phone call. living like by the phone. Yeah, and that, and that to me is, is one of the few things I get really, really emotional and defensive about because whether we choose to put our parents in that position or not, whether we choose to put our spouses in that position or not, it doesn't matter. The fact is, is that you know we chose a life of service and this is part of what comes with it. And for somebody to minimize what that loved one is going through, um, I think is completely unfair. It's out of line and it's disrespectful. And 
you know, even as I sit here now, I just think about my heart kind of almost trembles a little bit at the idea of what my mother must have been thinking every night she put her head on the pillow. Is this the last day I'm ever going to see my son? You know, and, and yeah. to that end, when you say your mother was sit- missing your brother's birthdays in middle school and sitting by your side, and, and you'll probably learn this one day when you're a parent, but when you become a parent, it kind of changes the game a little bit. And, and I, I totally understand your mother's position. And I, I don't look at her, I don't think anybody would ever look at her sideways. Uh, thankfully, it was only one of her three sons who was in that spot, but she would have done the same thing for your brothers had the coin flip been, reser- been reversed. You know oh, what I'm saying? Absolutely. So, absolutely. Yeah, it, 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 it's understandable from that end. Yeah. Um, and I mean, they, they told me every single day, you know, we love you. It's, you know, we, we want to take care of you. We want to help you heal. It's not a burden. But uh, as you just said, you know, you can't, no matter what you do, you can't get past that. It's your parents, it's your mom. And, uh, you know, when, when, Anyone in a family suffers, everyone does, but it's just especially hard knowing that, you know, I and feel again, some guilt like you put way. them there, you know? Yeah, abs- absolutely. Perfect. All right. Um, let's get to the actual Medal of Honor uh, and how it all went down. I mean, clearly you were awarded a Purple Heart. I mean, that happens fairly quickly. There's, there's not much work that goes into that. But when did you first start hearing the words Medal of Honor? Where were you and kind of how does this whole thing start? Uh, well, it first came up, actually, one of my fellow Lance Corporals, um, my buddy who, as crazy as this sounds, did four deployments, three full combat deployments to Afghanistan. And when he got out to celebrate, he had to get someone else to, to buy him a beer because he still wasn't 21. But uh, Get the he hell out of here, up. really? I know, crazy. He went in at 17, mom wow. signed, and he took off. But an amazing, amazing Marine, amazing guy, uh, Griffin Welch. But uh, he calls me up, and it was the end of February, and I was still inpatient in the hospital. I was kind of past the let's keep him breathing and let's keep him alive. I was past that, but I was still extremely kind of fragile and uh, early on in healing. But, you know, I got injured end of, end of November. Fast forward, and it was uh, my last few days of inpatient care, and I was down at a polytrauma recovery unit in Richmond, Virginia, at the VA there, and uh, I had actually made a made a huge trip out into town to the mall just to walk around and kind of get out. I was in a sling, I had an eye patch on, uh, and I was sitting there in the food court, and Griff calls me. He said, "Hey, man, you know, we know what you did. The guys that were there with you, you know, saw you do what you did. Kind of went through it and uh, said that, hey, you know, like I already knew, it, you know, this might not go anywhere, but we just want you to know that we believe in you. You know, we think that you should get this, and and you know, we're uh, we're honored to to put you up for." the Medal of Honor or any uh, type of award that would come with the actions that you did. And, uh, you know, I just, I kind of said, thanks. I was very honored and humbled and I appreciated, you know, their love and support for me. But, uh, on one hand, as you know, the process to, to, to receive a military award, even for something and none of them are minor, but even for something uh, nowhere near the Medal of Honor, it's not only a paperwork process, it's an evidence process, depending on how high it is, a full-on investigation. And when you're in a time of two conflicts, just on top of that and all the chaos going on in the Marine Corps, I mean, it takes a lot for, for you to have that any award kind of pinned on your chest and so that, along with knowing, hey, yes, there's a whole Marine Corps and a world going on around me and outside of these hospital walls, but I have, you know, minimum two more years in the hospital and roughly 30 to 50 surgeries to kind of put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And so I think to compartmentalize things and and not get too overwhelmed. I just heard it, 
you know, they told me that I thanked him for the call and what he said. And that was it. And I did not think another thing about it. I didn't really care. It wasn't, it, it wasn't even in the back of my head. It was just literally kind of like thumbs up. Thanks. Moving on. Fast forward years later, and I was still at Walter Reed, obviously doing much better, much stronger. I was really healing up. And I was getting uh, more towards the end of my road of surgeries. And I was at a Mexican restaurant right outside the gate of Walter Reed called Guapos uh, in Bethesda, Maryland. I was with a couple buddies, and uh, I get a call. It's Chief Warrant Officer 5 Reeves. And he told me that he had been assigned to 2nd Battalion, 9th Marines to continue and to lead and kind of spearhead the investigation into what went on that day on the roof. And I just quickly and honestly told him, I'm sorry, I don't really remember anything, especially any definitive kind of facts or things that could help you. Uh, He thanked me for my honesty and he told me that the marine corps and 29 my fellow marines no matter how this investigation turned out whether it ended in a potential medal of honor or not that they were proud of me and he thanked me for my service and we hung up and that was it fast forward after that over two years later and i'm starting to get calls from the pentagon and you know at this point I'm a sophomore at the University of South Carolina. I got out of the hospital a year and a half before. I had become independent financially, physically. I had moved on with my life. And I started getting these calls from uh, headquarters Marine Corps. Became more frequent as the months went on. And then... uh, When they're calling you, what are they asking you, though? Like, what's the conversation? uh, Just saying, hey, kind of... It's like an update? Well, see, no, I, the crazy thing is up until I walked into the White House, no one knew. I mean, maybe the commandant, but you would never know if he knew. No one knew in the entire military, unless you were the person, the secretary of the Navy, secretary of defense, uh, at the time, no one knew where this investigation was or if it was even still a thing. So I wanting to make school my priority, do good, make good grades, so on and so forth. I withdrew from my sophomore spring semester. I couldn't tell anyone. I was going to the Pentagon all during the week doing public relations training, you know, getting my uniforms ready. We were doing all this knowing that they could call tomorrow and say, oh, you know, it got denied. It's all over. Like, go back to school. So we were doing all this. I was, my friends thought I was in class. I was hanging out with them on the weekends and I was at the Pentagon during the week. And so, you know, the calls at first were more just, Hey, how you doing? What's going on in life? Kind of up, more updates on my end. And that kind of evolved into them, the Marine Corps, which they did beautifully preparing me, training me and getting me ready for this potential rollout of the Medal of Honor. And so we kept working for like three or four months, getting ready, not knowing where it was in the world and in the military chain of command. And then I get a call one day and, uh, you know, they tell me, hey, next Tuesday at this exact minute, I believe it was 136. I can't remember, but you're going to get a call from the president uh, regarding your potential Medal of Honor. So I hadn't withdrawn from classes at this point. Cause I was still in the first few weeks of the semester. So I, I was, I would have withdrawn anyway, if it, if it went on longer, but I was trying to push my time limit as far as possible in case it was a no, I didn't want to have lost a whole semester, a whole semester worth of credits and time. So I kept pushing, kept pushing and stayed in class. So when I was about to receive that call, I left class drove 30 minutes home because I wanted my parents and my brothers who we had checked out of school that day to experience that moment with me. And so I got home. I got yelled at by my mom because my (laughs) phone was only on 7% charge. 
Uh, even though it was just a phone call, she yelled at me for having nasty shoes on. <laughs> and so uh, I got my phone plugged in. I was rocking a solid 11% when the, when the president called. But I got that call, went back to class, finished that class or the classes for the day, and then I withdrew. And uh, that was in February, and I couldn't tell anyone uh, until June, obviously, when, when my ceremony happened. But so why, why didn't they want you to tell anybody? Uh, uh, that's, you know, that's a good question. I've never I mean, really like, thought about it. I just, you know, you don't... The, want to the spread Sarah, anything that you don't know is going to happen. So probably well, just... I mean, look, if you get a phone call from the president, right? Like, the ceremony is just the after effect. Like, it's already been signed off on. The president's already signed off on the Medal of Honor at this point, right? I mean, it's there's nothing no, left he, to do. He actually... Uh, he, I mean, he knew he was going to, but uh, it it's not official until myself and my family, we were all standing there in the Oval Office, and about 15 minutes before we walked to the East Wing and started the ceremony, that's when he signed my investigation package after over oh, two years. Wow. Okay. Signed it, put the pin back in the case, gave me the pin. And at that moment, after almost two, two and a half years of not knowing, it became official. But during the phone call, you know, he said, based upon the recommendation from the Secretary of the Navy and Secretary of Defense, and I've approved to, to award you the Medal of Honor. And he continued on to, to thank me and say how proud he was of the job myself and my fellow Marines did, uh, which meant a lot. But again, uh, we didn't know until that moment. And uh, yeah, it was crazy, though. I forget exactly what happened, but somehow some type of information got leaked to the newspapers. Surprise, surprise. And so I go down, and it's my sophomore, sophomore year spring break. Me and all my buddies, uh, of course, for spring break, we pile up. We go down to Cancun, Mexico. And we're down there. We had been down there for maybe like a day and a half. And uh, these two guys run up to me. It's probably 11 o'clock at night. And uh, they're like, Kyle Carpenter, are you serious? Like, Dude, like, uh, can we get a picture with you? Wow. I'm thinking, like, uh, yeah, but what's going on? They're like, you've been all over the news today. I'm like, what? Because they had just landed and just got there. And I guess while I had been on the plane and for the 12 hours I had been there, some somehow something got dropped. And so I'm down in Cancun with my phone off and the entire world and country is hearing about my story and I'm thinking we're still being, you know, all secretive about it. Uh, but that kind of got got the momentum going and got people knowing who I am and my story. Uh, but yeah, nothing was official and nothing really happened. Well, until, he had he had to sign it then. I mean, it was already out there. He couldn't go back, right? <laughs> uh, uh, who knows? I don't know. <laughs> so you go to D.C. for the ceremony. Uh, just what's the day like? I mean, you know, of all. Uh, the, the moments in your life, it's got to be near the top of the coolest ones, no? Uh, yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. It was, uh, well, uh, it was just so chaotic. I mean, you have your ceremony week, which is the first kind of six, seven days. Then you have your media tour week. And, you know, before the ceremony day even came about, I had already started building my speaking career and myself and my professional life. So I already had that going. I was you know, still without really knowing it, healing kind of self-reflecting and thinking about what had happened to me, where I had been, where I was going, you know, cause I went high school, Marine Corps, Marine Corps, Afghanistan, Afghanistan to injury I used my last six, eight months in the hospital to do a couple of internships while doing admissions paperwork uh, stuff to get into college and just make that quick and seamless transition. So I went from three years in the hospital to two weeks later, walk into freshman classes. So I hadn't really had any time to, um, to heal. And so when all of this happened, not only did I already have this whole life, but then the Medal of Honor made things a million times crazier. And so 
in that moment, it was powerful. It was amazing. I was so thankful and honored and humbled to be recognized by my country and told thank you. Uh, but now, after years of, of really thinking about it, in that moment, all I really knew was it wasn't my medal. And it was no medal or award that is for any individual. An individual represents it, but it represents so much more than that one individual. So when I really thought about it, you know, it not only represents my story and my journey, but that journey and that struggle that my parents and family went through with me, the, the people of Afghanistan that, again, are oppressed and the children that ask me through interpreters, which I talk about in the book, but ask me through interpreters is everywhere in America like Disney World. And can you really <laughs> go into a room and turn a knob and get fresh, clean drinking water? And can you really try to learn how to read without being scared that you're going to get killed and so it not only represents those people all around the world but then you know the marines that were there on the ground with me serving and sacrificing those like you know dakota hughes that didn't make it back you know those you know those like lance corporal nikki frazio that will forever be battling back and trying to heal from those brain injuries and then you go beyond that, and it represents all of those generations that you know, so heroically and courageously paved the way for our generation and my generation. And again, those that charged the beaches in World War II, those that were gassed in the trenches of World War I. And, and above all of that, those that not only gave that last full measure of devotion, but 40, 50, 60 years later, they're still missing in action. We can't tell their families you know, how they gave their last breath. And so uh, it's, it's amazing. Uh, and again, I'm thankful to be, to be recognized by my country, but the Medal of Honor is heavy and it's a beautiful burden. Kyle, you speak so eloquently and so poetically about being a Marine. What do you miss the most about being a Marine? Well, that's just because, you know, Marines are, we're just so intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you uh, said it. I didn't. All right. I'm not, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not going as close uh, to that as you went to the grenade. All right. So let's, let's just <laughs> leave that one alone. Uh, that's funny. No, I'm kidding. But, uh, and what was the question, sir, before my <laughs> wonderful joke? <laughs> what do you miss the most about being a Marine and Marine life? What I miss the most, uh, you know, it, it's amazing to wake up, you know, with a definitive purpose and plan. You know, you might only be training, you might be sitting around the barracks for a couple hours playing video games, you know, but all in all, to wake up every day with your fellow Marines with a definitive purpose and a mission is amazing. And of course, that and the camaraderie, you know, I think we all miss that. Uh, even if not all the time, we all miss that sometimes. But I think the thing that I miss the most is the unknown and the unknown of not knowing where you're going, what's in store for you, what's going to happen. Uh, and even though there's so many unknowns and so many variables, you know, you have and all you have is those Marines to the right and left of you and your mission. And I just, uh, you know, it's, it's a thrill and it's powerful and amazing to not really have control over your journey and just know that all you can do is prepare and take care of each other. And no matter what life has in store, you know, what life or military grenades are going to get thrown at you. Uh, that, you know, you're there together and you have each other and that's really all you know. I assume you still keep in touch with a lot of your fellow Marines, correct? Oh, yeah, absolutely. The corpsman that saved me, my chain of command, some of them, but uh, yeah, that's correct. Anything different with your interactions with them now or is it still like it? nothing has ever changed? 
Besides that, they give me way more shit than they did before. <laughs> Nothing's really changed. <laughs> well, there is that. So I know you've talked. <laughs> I know you've talked a lot about you know the things that you're thankful for, and but. Yeah. Off the top of your head, if I ask you, what are you most grateful for? What sort of words and, and things come to mind? Every day. Every single day, I am thankful that I have not only woke up to a new day, but I catch myself um, all the time. Like, even in this moment right now, talking to you, I'm sitting in beautiful, sunny, warm unlike the east coast california <laughs> i'm looking out all these beautiful flowers and trees after we hang up this call i got a couple more but after that i can go jump in the ocean if i want i can go ride a horse or i can just go walk around be alive and appreciate it and every single day there's always something, you know, like a couple weeks ago, I got a, a bike and we're, we're still talking manual. I have to pedal uh, for every, every foot I want to go. So mom, don't freak out. It's not a motorcycle. Cause she told me that if I ever got a motorcycle, it would be uh, a grenade would be the least of my worries. So with that said, I got a bike a couple weeks ago and uh, it, it's amazing. I've been riding it all over Charlotte, been taking on trails, but I was riding and I just thought to myself, like I do with so many life experiences, like, wow, I was so close to never experiencing this. I was so close to never crossing that finish line of a marathon or jumping out of a plane. And so uh, it, it's, it's uh, kind of bittersweet to know and realize this. Uh, it's it's a beautiful thing to appreciate uh, life so much, but what I have found is it's also scary, and not that I'm scared of of death because I've tasted it and I know how dark it is. It's just scary that to to know and to truly realize and feel how finite life is, and so. Uh, and, and I think because of that allows me to realize just really how amazing and like beautiful this life is. One final thought. Why the book? I mean, wh what's the purpose of it? Is it, is it another way to tell your story, to give more background? And again, the title of it is You Are Worth It. Obviously, you can get it on uh, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, bookstores everywhere. But what was the reason for writing it? I wanted to help people. I wanted to permanently put my story my journey the journey of so many people that not only helped save me and keep me breathing but also helped me rebuild this life that i'm loving to live uh through the years and so uh to help people through struggle to give thanks and appreciation where it is deserved and warranted um and, and kind of the third and, and maybe final piece of it is uh, I wanted to um, I wanted to share perspective with people that thankfully they might not have ever had to try to learn or think about and and uh, I wanted to share that people, I guess, getting back to my first point of helping people through struggle. And I don't think we should ever say, oh, well, it can, it can you know, all be worse because that makes your, you know, you might look at your struggle like, oh, well, it's not that big of a deal when really it could be that big of a deal. So uh, just to empower people and help them through that struggle and also, you know, people, the you know, media interviews, no matter what it is, uh, unlike these podcast platforms, which I love because it allows me to really dive into who I am, what I believe and, and what I feel like I should pass on to people, you know, for nine years now, almost everyone has always got the three to five minute 
version of this thing. news yeah. article right. or, or, or news clip. And so I feel like as crazy as it is, even after Letterman and all these things that are out there, uh, no one really knew who I was. And not only that, no one really knew what I had been through and what happened during those long, dark and painful nights and what I had to go through to learn, you know, cause people say, and I'm so thankful for like, wow, like your perspective, your outlook, you know, is amazing. It's so positive, all these things, but yeah, I'm, that's amazing. That's what I've strived for all these years. And I'm thankful that I have kind of mentally evolved to knowing those things, but you know, those lessons and that perspective and all of that, at times I was forced to take those small steps. And so many times I was forced to search for that perspective and those silver linings through those, those, deep dark and painful nights and so you know with, with that said a part of writing this book is um you know i wanted people to to really know my story and not just the five minute you know media kyle carpenter well to that end um in you know nearly the hour and 45 minutes you and i have been going back and forth feeling like i know you a little bit better than i did two hours ago you know, I see a young man who is thoughtful, pensive, um, you know, very much self-aware of who he is and what's around him and isn't bogged down by circumstances in life and things that are handed to him, yet someone who is opportunistic enough to see that whatever is in front of them can be turned into something that is good. And I think that is a central thesis and a central message of what our audience will leave this podcast with uh, is simply that you, um, and as cliche as it is of making lemonades out of lemons, but it's deeper than that. It is more of a, there is a grander purpose in making lemonade out of lemons. And for each individual, it's ultimately up to you to find that. Uh, but I think you have shown people that whatever the circumstances are, the meaning behind those actions is truly what will define them as an individual. Well, thank you. That's uh, all I can hope for. And uh, I really appreciate that. Uh, Kyle Carpenter, your story is amazing. It certainly is one that people have talked about, but I cannot thank you enough for being so honest and open with us and sharing everything. And certainly thank you for being part of the Hazard Ground. Oh, you're welcome, sir. I, again, I appreciate your time and lending me your platform to just help get the good word out there and try to help people. So this has been great. I look forward to uh, round number two, whenever that is. And uh, <laughs> thanks again for, for the time. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno and produced by Matt Pascarella. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at hazardgroundpodcast at gmail.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.